All right, well then uh, we will go ahead and get started. So um, thank you all for, for being here today. And uh, a special thank you to our friends at Mechatronic Solutions for, for hosting this event. Um, it's pretty exciting. I love the new building. It's uh, my first time being here, so I'm pretty excited to, to see what you all got going on. And uh, again, thank you for being here. So we're going to talk a little bit about machine and process safety. Um, like I said, it's a lot more fun with beer. It's not too late, but machine and process safety isn't usually something that, that too many people just really get excited about. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I'm one of those people that is fairly passionate about it. So um, I'm honored to be able to, to share with you a little bit about what, uh, you know, what we, what we do uh, with respect to safety and, and you know, what, what um, we think you ought to be looking for with respect to safety at your facilities. So um, we don't have a lot of uh, time. We, don't, we can't go real deep into subjects in the, in the presentation today, um, but I'm certainly more than happy to answer any questions or point you in the right direction if you do have a question. So by all means, please do um, a ask any questions. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on uh, Omron safety and ex expertise, um, you know, kind of some of our qualifications. Why are we qualified to talk about safety? What have we learned over the years? We'll share some of those experiences. Um, reasons we think you ought to consider functional safety and why that's important. Um, we'll talk about a case study or two and then uh, some of our findings when we do risk assessments. Are you all doing risk assessments? Who's ever done a risk assessment or been a part of a risk assessment? Few? Okay, all right. Um, so we'll talk about some of the things that we typically find when we do a risk assessment, um, and then we'll wrap up with some uh, safety myths, all right? So uh, we'll, we'll jump into it. So a little bit about Omron real quickly. I promise this is not gonna be a 60 minute commercial about Omron. Uh, I, I, I do feel like I wanna tell you a little bit about it real quickly. Um, Key thing to point out, our mission. Our mission is to improve lives and contribute to a better society. We pursue that mission through four different business groups. Industrial automation, healthcare, social systems, and electronic components. So industrial automation is all the stuff you see out on the floor, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Healthcare, blood pressure monitors, uh, thermometers, uh, uh, Cardio, what do they call those that, that uh, monitor your heart rate? EKGs, right? So do those. Um, social systems, moving people around, power distribution, those types of things, uh, and electronic components. Everybody's got a cell phone, a laptop, appliances. So broken down into four different business groups, and that's how we pursue that mission of improving lives and contributing to a better society. Right? Uh, spread out all across the world. 117 different countries. And so we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of just tease you a little bit here with our safety portfolio. Uh, I think Omron's in a unique position in that we have a complete portfolio when it comes to safety. Uh, so not only do we have the door switches, but we also have your uh, presence sensing devices, area scanners, light curtains to detect that somebody has breached an area and, and potentially exposed to an unsafe condition, um, emergency stops, controllers. So we've got safety controllers, right? Uh, so a full safety lineup. Much of that is out on display on the floor. So when you get a chance, you might want to take a look at that. Um, some really good stuff there. And we're happy to answer any questions about it. But again, not, not want to spend our whole time on a big commercial here. Uh, so Omron also offers services. So services include, of course, technical support, training. So we offer a lot of different training classes. TUV, anybody here TUV certified? Who's, who's TUV certified in the room? Anybody? Okay, we got one, one. Anybody else? Do you know what that is? Anybody heard of it? Anybody interested in it? Okay, well, we can talk later, but TUV certification is uh, one of the training services that we offer. Um, robot and repair services. Anybody see any robots out there? A couple, right? <laughs> so we have robot repair services, um, and then of course safety services. And we'll talk a little bit about the safety services and what that looks like, right? And that's really where we gain a lot of our knowledge is through, through actually practicing what we preach. So we do machine safety training, of course, consulting, risk assessments. We actually, and, and not everybody knows this, but we actually fabricate, 
design, fabricate, and install machine and process safeguards. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that process, and um, through that process, you learn quite a bit. You make a few mistakes, but you learn a lot. And we're, tr we're trying to share those things with you today. So um, on, on staff, we have over 40 TUV certified functional safety engineers. I'm not sure if any individual organization has more than that. Uh, I'm not sure, there might be somebody, but that is an, an impressive amount of TV fu functional safety engineers. Uh, two TV Rhineland functional safety experts. So that's like the next level. If you didn't get enough with just becoming TV certified functional safety engineer, which means you gotta know the standards inside and out. And I'm not talking just OSHA, um, but I'm actually talking about ISO standards, machinery directive, European standards. So um, expert level, we've got two on staff, um, over 60 America's based participants in standard committees. So it's not just one or two individuals that are participating in standards committees. So why is that important? Why is it important that we're involved with the standards community? Anybody, what do you think? But why would that be important to an organization? What do you think? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That's a great answer. Yeah, we want to be involved. We want to be engaged in that community. We want to understand it. We want to live it, breathe it, and be a part of it. So. As a manufacturer, we actually participate in these standards. We're involved. We help write the standards. Now, so do many of our competitors. So do a lot of machine builders. So do a lot of different organizations. So there, there's, there's consensus participation across a wide variety of people, um, and that helps make these, these consensus standards powerful groups. And it also helps us stay up to date on not only the current standards, but help understand where it's headed, right? So that's, that's a pretty important piece. Uh, and we've got quite a bit of experience in designing safety solutions. So we mentioned a couple of people raised their hand when I said, hey, has anybody done a, a, a risk assessment before, right? But we wanna kind of move a little beyond the risk assessment. We wanna dive in a little deeper, right? So look at some of these things here. We teach our operators to keep their hands out of the machines. Anybody ever heard that? I have heard that. I, these are real quotes. I have heard that. We teach our operators to keep their hands out of the machines. I've been here, all tw I've been here for 20 years and still have all my fingers. What do I need safety for? Right? Anybody ever heard that? I've heard it. All right. So a couple of examples of, of uh, maybe not so friendly uh, <laughs> signs here, but you get the idea. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. Uh, so, you know, we want to kind of dive into safety and really lean into it and, and really get an idea of, you know, how we can how we can identify some of the potential pitfalls before they happen. And really, we think that's all about safety. So a couple of reasons we, we think uh, safety is important. Of course, m employee morale. Uh, especially today, everybody, who, raise your hand if you do not have a cell phone. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? Your kids have cell phones. Um, we're, we're the last generation, well, I, I won't lump y'all in with me, but I, I know I'm the last generation to experience life before cell phones. From here on out, everybody has had a cell phone their entire life. Um, but that changes how we communicate as well. If I had a bad experience at a restaurant or if I had a bad experience with a car dealership or whatever the case may be, maybe I'd tell a few friends. Nowadays, if I've got a bad experience, I can tell the whole world about my experience, right? In just a few minutes, right? So um, it's important to have a safe workplace. It's, it, this is a piece of it, right? We want our employees to be happy. We want them to be safe. And we don't want them to report, hey, this company doesn't care about their employees. People are getting hurt and they're not doing anything about it. So that's a, you know, a piece of, of, of why we do things, to, to make sure that we have a safe environment. It costs a lot of money. When we don't safeguard our employees, it costs a tremendous amount of money through insurance, 
through attorney fees, training new employees, lost productivity, the list goes on and on, right? Also, compliance with the law. Now, you may say, hey, whoa, that's our number one priority. We want to be compliant. But I think the other two are a huge contributing factor in why we want to be safe also, right? We want our employees to have a safe work environment. So, of course, it's part of the law. Here in the U.S., it's OSHA. Mexico, it's the normatives. Canada, Ministry of Labor. Labor. Brazil, we've got the NR12. Anybody experience, any experience with NR12 down in Brazil? No? Okay. That one is interesting. Uh, the machinery directive. Now, the machinery directive, that one's interesting because that really is infiltrating and, and really spreading across the entire world, right? So the machinery directive, that's part of this TV certified functional safety engineer training I was talking about. We need to understand the machinery directive out of Europe. So you've seen the CE mark, conformity, right? So they're, they're, they're declaring or they get a declaration of conformity on their machine and it allows them to put a CE mark. Declaring conformity with what? With the machinery directive, right? So that's, that's Europe. Uh, and then China, of course, has their own safety standards as well, the GB. So a lot of text here. It's going to be fun reading this one, all right? Uh, I put this up here for a reason, though, okay? One of the reasons is many people have never had the privilege or opportunity to go to the OSHA.gov website and look up 1910.212, for example. General requirements for all machines. So what does it say? Okay, blindfolded. One or more methods of machine guarding shall be provided to protect the operator and others in the air, right? This is the lifeblood of safeguarding machines here in the US. Uh, anybody from Canada? Anybody here from Canada? We're, we're pretty darn close to the border. Nope, okay. All right, so this applies to all of us in the room, right? So one or more methods of machine guarding shall be provided to protect operators, okay? And a continuation of that, so that's A, and that's A, three, two, uh, Machine has to be uh, uh, guarded here. The point of operation has to be guarded and shall be uh, guarded. Now, this is the interesting piece. The guarding devices, whatever we're putting on the machine, the guarding device shall be in conformity with any appropriate standards. So, I, hey, I like the way you're thinking right there. All right, that's going to make this class a lot more fun. All right, so shall be in conformity with any appropriate standards. So what's an appropriate standard? What do you think an appropriate standard might be? So you have OSHA regulations, and then you have all these industry standards, right? You have ISO, you have ANSI, you have CSA. So are these, are these standards important? If we have OSHA, what do we need anything else for, right? Well, all of these consensus standards, one, are updated a little more frequently than OSHA regulations. So that language up here that we're looking at, 1910.212, anybody want to take a guess on when that was written into law? 1910. That's not a bad guess. Anybody else? 2012, not bad. You guys got it surrounded. So in 1970, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was enacted by Congress. So 1970. You know how much this language has changed since 1970? We have a winner. You get a free beer. All right? We have a winner. Yeah, this language doesn't change. They put the law in place, and the law pretty much stays put. Now, there have been some minor changes to other regulations over the year, but this is the law. OSHA is the law, and OSHA can cite for noncompliance with the law. OSHA cannot cite for noncompliance with an industry consensus standard. Hey, this machine isn't compliant with ANSI B11X, whatever that is. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. OSHA only cites for noncompliance with the OSHA regulation. Okay, so this is important to know and understand what language your OSHA compliance officers are looking at. 
So this is it. And the guarding device shall be in conformity with any appropriate standards, therefore. Uh, and then the idea is that it needs to prevent the operator from having any part of his body in the danger zone during the operating cycle. So that's the language. If you've never seen it before, that's pretty important stuff. And then I just threw up uh, uh, 1910 to which is a mechanical power transmission. Anything seven feet or less from the floor shall be guarded. So this is your belts, chains, sprackets, pulleys, linkages, all that kind of stuff. If it's seven feet or less off the, off the floor uh, or the working surface, that all needs to be guarded. Okay? So these are kind of the, the, the OSHA, what I call big three. There's a reason we call them the big three. Why do you think that is? Anybody? What do you think? We call them the big three because those are the most often cited regulations by OSHA, right? This, this all pertains directly to machine guarding. All right. Who's heard of the general duty clause? Heard of the general duty? Okay, we've got one. General duty clause. So this is the blanket. This is the, the, the blanket that covers all workplaces. So this says, each employer shall furnish to each of his employees a place of employment um, which are free from recognized hazards causing or likely to cause death or serious. Okay? So you, you get the picture. See, so basically they're saying you have to have a safe workplace. Now, how do you know it's a safe workplace? Well, nobody got hurt today. Does that mean you have a safe workplace? I, I, that's a tough one. We call this performance-based language. So performance-based language says, hey, you have to perform this way. Where does it tell me what color my guards have to be? Where does it tell me how tall my guards have to be? Where does it tell me how far they have to be from the hazard? Where does it tell me about stop time measurements? or what a light curtain is and how it works and how it ought to be installed or how an area scanner, how far off the ground it should be mounted. Where do I find that? You're certainly not gonna find it in an OSHA regulation. It doesn't exist, I've looked, right? So it's not in the OSHA regulations, but it is in the consensus standards, right? We'll find that language both in the ISO standards, which are our international standards, or our ANSI standards, which are our North American standards. And, and of course, there's Murphy's Law, right? If it can go wrong, it probably will go wrong. And my dad would say, at the worst possible time. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about the regulations, okay? So we'll kind of dive in a little further. Um, there's what we call horizontal standards, and then there's vertical standards. So horizontal standards, what I mean when I say a horizontal standard or a horizontal regulation, that's like a blanket that covers all machine types or all workplaces. Okay? So look at this, the 1910-147. Everybody remember what that one is? I had it up earlier. Lockout tag. Very good. Thank you. Uh, if I had gold stars, you'd get one. All right, so lockout tag. And then the 1910-212, we just dissected that language. That said one or more methods of machine guarding shall be and on and on. So that's the 1910-212, but that's, that covers all machines. That's not specific to any particular machine. It just says, hey, in the workspace, that's what you gotta do. So horizontal standards, and then we have what we call vertical standards, or vertical regulations, okay? So regulation is the law, standard is a consensus standard. So, for example, mechanical power presses. Right? We have a specific OSHA vertical, which is rare, because OSHA doesn't have a whole lot of those. Um, and then we have an ANSI vertical. So the ANSI vertical is ANSI B11-1. So B11-1 specifically addresses mechanical power presses and how you need to guard them. B11-2 is hydraulics, B11-3 is press brakes, 4 is shears, on and on. But you have these vertical standards. So I'm pointing this out because if you're trying to figure out what you've got in your facility, what you need to do from a guarding standpoint, I would say, look, you start right here, and that's a, that, that gets you going, and then you start to look and see if there's a vertical standard for your machine. Industrial robots, grinding machines. And if we had enough space, we could go all the way down the wall and just keep going with vertical standards. But 
what I want you to understand, there's always going to be horizontals that cover everything. Now, if you've come up with the latest, greatest whiz-bang machine, is there a vertical standard for your machine that no one else on the planet has ever seen before? No. No. Why would anybody take the time to develop a vertical safety standard that applies to your machine that no one else has ever seen before? So it's very common to have new equipment that there is no vertical standard. It doesn't exist. Nobody's ever made anything like this before. We're the first ones. Okay? So it's, it's entirely possible that you'll have equipment in your facility that does not have a vertical standard that applies directly to that type of equipment. But it'll always have, it'll always fall under that blanket of the horizontal standards, right? So the horizontals uh, are equally important. I'm not going to say one's more important than the other, but I'm going to say that there are going to be times where you have specific verticals. And I would refer to that specific vertical if I were looking for specifics on how my machine needs to be properly guarded. And that's how I would measure it. Now, kind of circling back to what I said before. When it comes to machine guarding, who's the police? Who's the enforcement arm? If, my, if I don't have a safe workplace, who is it? Who, who, who enforces it? Who can write me a citation? Four-letter word. OSHA. Thank you. OSHA. Yeah. So OSHA is kind of like the police, right, when it comes to machine guarding. So if I'm driving my car down the road and I blow through a stop sign, is the police officer going to look at the, the make of my car and say, oh, well, that's a Ford or that's a Nissan or that's a whatever, and write a ticket to the manufacturer of that car? Of course not. They're going to go after the user of the vehicle. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to OSHA. When it comes to equipment, if somebody gets injured on a piece of equipment, OSHA's not going to come to the manufacturer and say, hey, you should have made a safer machine. Well, we'll let the lawyers do that, right? OSHA is going to come to the user or the employer and say, you should have had a safe machine for your employee, and here's the rule, and now you're in violation of that rule, so here's your citation. Right? So that's how it works with machine guarding. So, does OSHA actually enforce these standards? Who's had a run in with a, a compliance officer? Anybody? Nobody's ever had an encounter with a compliance officer? Consider yourself fortunate. Okay. Uh, they're good people. I did a lot of training. This is Region 5. I did a lot of training for OSHA compliance officers in Region 5 several years ago. Um, and we, we spent a lot of time together. I got to ask them a lot of questions. They, of course, asked me a few. Uh, but I think I learned just as much from them as they did from me. But one of the things I learned is that, yeah, they do enforce these. And yes, they do write citations. Um, here's a list of the number of violations. Now, um, granted, this is a little old. Every year, they're, they're constantly coming up with stuff. Um, but the numbers um, are, are generally pretty darn high. And there's a couple of trends that I've noticed after tracking this for many years. And that is that machine guarding, even though it's down here at number nine, in the 20 years that I've been tracking it, machine guarding has never once dropped out of the top 10. And this lockout tag out here is still right up near the top, right up near the top. And that's been going on for years and years and years. So um, we, 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 we're doing better, but uh, we still have a long way to go. So this is interesting here. We don't have to read the whole thing, but I just want to point out, here's the penalty per violation, $13,000 for a serious violation, okay? So now that's per. So if you have four identical machines and somebody gets hurt on this machine here, well, there's your $13,000 violation there, plus this one, plus that one, plus this one. Okay, well, there you go. I was, what was that, 52, 20, oh, somewhere around there, 52, 50, okay. Now, in addition, failure to abate per day. Can anybody read, can you read that in the back? What does that say? Somebody. Per day, the abatement date, right? So $13,000 a day after the time period that they've given you. Uh, and then willful and repeated 
you can see the amount there, 130,000. So pretty significant citations, and that's the authority that OSHA has. Do they enforce it? Yeah, they do. So here's just a couple of quick examples. Here's 140,000, oops, sorry. Um, what was it, 140,000 in that particular case. Machine uh, without proper guarding. We'll look at the next one, 145,000. Written procedures, unintended startup and maintenance, uh, and this one failing to effectively guard machine and implement, okay? So do they enforce it? Yeah, they do. Uh, about $900,000 a month is, is the tune of, of what they're enforcing. Uh, that changes all the time, so uh, anyway. It's expensive if you don't guard correctly. Uh, and and it's, it, it's the reaction, right? It's, it's guarding after the fact. Um, because if you get the citation, if you have the injury and then you get the citation and then you gotta do all the guarding, um, that can be rather costly. And so our suggestion is, hey, let's get good at this. Let's do this up front. Let's understand what's required from a, 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 a equipment operational standpoint and let's put effective guarding means in place. Okay, so we'll take a look at a case study. Now, this particular machine I'm gonna show you, I wanna give you a little background on it. Um, this one's been around for a while. Now, uh, I was living in California at the time, and we had recently completed a machine safeguarding risk assessment on, I'm gonna say, probably 200 pieces of equipment. Now, back in those days, what we did is we printed out, it was about two pages per machine, okay? So you had a couple hundred machines and two pages per machine, so you got like 500 pieces of paper, right? A pretty big report. We deliver the report to this customer. They're headquartered in Pittsburgh. And um, we deliver the report, and the guy, um, the the guy at the facility starts going through the report and just like, wow, this is a lot of information here. Okay, well, let's just randomly pick a few machines so I can get an idea, a feel for what's in this report. He opens up a page and he looks at one particular machine. And he says, okay, well, let's dive into this one. Let me see what you found, okay? And it happened to be this particular machine right here. He just randomly, just random luck, right? Um, and what he found startled him. He's like, hold on. What do you guys say? You're saying that we have to do stuff to this machine? This is one of our better guarded machines in, in our facility. I don't think you guys know what you're talking about. And before he really gave us a chance to explain, I got, what's a polite way of saying you got kicked out? We got, escort, we got asked, I don't know, there was a conflict in the schedule and we were asked to leave. Let's put it that way, okay? So, um, all I know is I get a phone call a couple days later from a gentleman at headquarters in Pittsburgh and says, hey, we need to talk because I've got a, a, a plant that's saying you guys are ripping people off and you all need to come in here and sit down and we're going to discuss this. So hop on a plane to Pittsburgh. We sit down in the guy's office and this, these are the slides that I put together for that particular gentleman for this company. Okay? So... We had a machine, okay, a little press here. It has a light curtain on it. This is the light curtain right here, okay, that's the light curtain. Here's the mirrors that go across the front, and then there's a, so you got a transmitter, mirror, mirror, receiver. Three-sided guarding, it's got a light curtain on it. It appears to be in compliance. No one's ever been hurt on that machine that they know of, and they had a compliance officer come through the building now, they weren't specifically looking at this press, but they'd already had a compliance officer in the building, which is the reason we were there doing risk assessments on all their machines. But that's, that's part of it. So, like, hey, you, I, I'm not sure you guys know what you're talking about. I'm not sure we should pay the bill for this assessment. Okay, so I sit down at corporate, say, okay, well, here's what we found. Okay, walk me through it. Your light curtains, they're type two, not type four. What's the difference? Well, type four light curtain is designed for safety applications. Type two is not. 
Okay? Whole different circuitry, no cross-checking, redundancy internal. Okay? One's built for safety, one's not. The light curtains are mounted too close to the point of operation. Well, where do they need to be mounted? Well, it has to be determined by a stop time measurement. So based on the stopping time of the machine, we have to adjust those light curtains back at a safe distance so that if somebody breaches the light curtain, the press can come to a stop before they can reach the hazard zone. Oh, that's required? It sure is. Operators can reach around the light curtain into the point of operation. So let me back up for just a second. Well, actually, you can kind of see it. Okay, but on this side here, you've got a control cabinet. Over here, you can reach between the frame of the machine and the light curtain. Well, who would do that? Remember that one of those early slides I showed you? We train our people not to put their hands into the machine, right? Okay, So you can reach into the point of operation. You can reach right around the light curtain into the point of operation. Well, only an idiot would do that. And we never hire idiots, so we're in good shape, right? Right? Uh, okay. The emergency stop button, it wasn't the proper type. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Well, I'll show you an example. Um, no anti-tie down on the two-hand controls. So two-hand controls, hit two buttons, that causes the machine to cycle. If I hold one button, or if I, I hit both of them, and I, I keep one held down, that machine will just sit there and cycle. Well, that's not good. What if I tie a rope, or if, what if I ball up a rag, and I put a piece of tape around it, and I put it on one button, and I just turn it into a single push button operation? Hmm, okay. So that's not compliant. So we found that, okay? Clutch control valve, reach through the back side of the machine. Now, I didn't have photos of every angle of the machine, so this is a different machine here, the green. Um, but you could reach through right through the back of the machine. The machine was not anchored. It didn't have a stopping performance monitor. That is unique to mechanical presses, um, but they do have to have a stopping performance monitor. Uh, Non-compliant disconnect inside the control. We haven't even touched the controls yet, right? Inside the cabinet. Light curtain tied into a stop circuit on the machine control, not redundant, not monitored, and not control reliable. Well, that's kind of a legacy term that not a lot of people use anymore. Anybody heard that term, control reliable? Yeah, okay. So that's a term from the ANSI world, from the OSHA world, uh, and now we're talking about performance levels when it comes to machine controls, but the idea is that that machine control is not compliant. So we tied our, we tied our light curtain into the machine control, and we could have a simple relay failure lead to a complete loss of safety. Okay? So how do we achieve compliance? Well, we had to do a whole bunch of stuff, right? We had to replace the light curtain, fabricate some guards, add some, I mean, it's just a whole list. So here's the deal. I told you I had to hop on a plane on short notice, get out to Pittsburgh, sit down in this gentleman's office. I laid all this out for him. These are the slides I used. Laid all this out for him. Jim? You guys know what you're doing. Please continue. I'll have a word with the folks at the plant. You're free to proceed. And we, we went on and we did a lot of business with that organization. But the point is that they were walking past that machine, and so did the compliance officer, and they never saw anything that made them think that there was a problem, and no one had been injured on the machine. And yet when you dive right into it, you find a lot of different things. Hey, these things are not compliant, and here's why. So it's, it's good to understand the safety. Do we need to go to this extent on every machine? I think so. I do. I, I think so. I think that's the extent that we need to go through. We need to make sure that every machine. If you're building new equipment, we should absolutely make sure that every new piece of equipment is fully compliant. I like to tell my customers, look, let's draw a line in the sand. And let's say that no new equipment is allowed to enter this building unless it's completely compliant. Now we have this legacy, so, so everything new will be compliant. And we've got an agreement on that. We'll write that into our purchase order agreements. It has some boilerplate language that says, this machine shall be compliant with applicable standards upon arrival. Uh, if not, we're not paying the bill, however you want to write it. So you draw a line in the sand and say, no more new equipment coming in the door unless it's compliant. And then 
What do we do with this existing aging population of equipment? Well, that's where you got to do your risk assessment and determine, all right, let's prioritize. If we have whole body access, if we have amputation potential, if we have fatality potential, maybe that's where we get started. But somehow you got to get a game plan together that says this is how we're going to address that existing population of equipment, and that's going to take us a year, or that's going to take us five years, or somewhere in between. But you put an action plan together. All right. Okay. So... Um, I, I, I mentioned this earlier. What are the things that we find in risk assessments? So I took you through the case study and we found a whole bunch of stuff. But what are the most common things that we find? We'll walk through it here. No point of operation guarding. That's pretty common. That's the first place you look, right? And that's probably the first place you, you, you think, hey, we need to fix that. But at, as you dive into it, what about the safety controls? If we put a light curtain on a machine, that isn't capable of stopping like that, have we effectively guarded that machine? Chances are we have not, right? So the presence, the appearance of safety does not equal safety, right? So we have to make sure that what's happening in that box on the, on the uh, side of the machine, who's, who's an electrician in here? Who's electricians or electrical engineers? Electrical backgrounds, okay, one, okay. So, uh, all right, well, you hold me accountable if I lie about this. But if I tied a light curtain in and I had a simple ice cube relay, um, can that ice cube relay fail, first of all, yes or no? Yep, okay. Do relays fail? Yeah, yeah eventually, right? Okay. Now, do we know how they're going to fail? One way or the other, so we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 So is it possible that I could have the contacts on my relay weld and I stick my hand through a light curtain and the relay doesn't react and the machine keeps running? So it's important, and you agree? Yeah, it, it, it's possible. Right? Okay, so that's what we want to avoid. So not only whatever we put on the front of the machine from a physical appearance and, 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 and detection standpoint, but what's, what's inside that electrical cabinet, that, that magical mystery box on the side of the machine? That's really important too. And we gotta dive into that. And we need to have a qualified electrician make sure that we, we are tied in correctly. And we have a control reliable safety circuit. All right, non-compliant emergency stops. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. And of course, our energy isolation or lockout tagout. So those are the most common things that we find when we do an, a risk assessment. It's like boom, boom, boom. It's almost <laughs> like clockwork, right? You just you do it enough times, you start seeing patterns. So point of operation guarding. I won't bother reading all of this to you. The point of operation guarding. Think of the auto acronym. Around, under, through, or over, auto. If I'm, if I'm using physical guards, auto is the principle that I need to employ. You can't reach around, under, through, or over the guard into the hazard. If I can, then my guard is probably not compliant. Now, we can take that one step further and look at an ANSI standard. It will tell us, based on the hazard height, your guard needs to be this high or it needs to be this far from the hazard. So we can get into all the nitty gritty details, but if you walk up to the machine and you can reach over, under, around, or through the guarding and touch the hazard, then your physical guarding would not be compliant. All right. We have a device for that. Oh, I forgot mine. I was going to bring it in and show it to you. Uh, anybody ever seen or heard of a gotcha stick before? Okay. There's a couple different versions out there. Um, the, the, we have a kind of a hybrid version. Um, so there's, there's two or three different companies that distribute these gotcha sticks. And they're different sizes. If you laid all three of them on top of each other, they're going to look slightly different. The reason ours looks different from the others is that we're taking the most conservative values from both OSHA, the O10 table from the mechanical power standard, uh, power press standard, uh, and we're taking the ANSI data and we're taking ISO data. And we're saying, okay, worst case based on this distance from this standard. So we have a unique stick that's a really good catch-all. 
All right. So, um, but the stick is used to determine, hey, I've got an existing guard on the machine. Is it compliant? You slide it in there and it'll tell you. All right. So if you're interested in one of those, um, let me know, contact me or just let me know afterwards and I, we can get you one. I can send you one or I might even have a couple in my bag. I can get you one today. All right. Control circuits. I want to talk about control circuits briefly and I want to make sure we save a little time for questions too, if we had any. Um, but Safety circuits, essentially, we're looking for a control reliable or a, a well-designed, let's, let's, let's use just some generic terms. We're looking for a well-designed safety circuit. And what constitutes a well-designed safety circuit? Right. Well, part of that is we need the ability for that safety circuit to achieve a safe state in the event of a failure within the safety-related components. So wait a minute. I mean, I, you gotta read that a few times before it really sinks in, okay? Especially if you're not a controls engineer. You, I, you got a safety system. And if the safety system fails, we have to achieve a safe state? Yeah, that's, oh, you got a gotcha stick. Thank you, Matt. All right. I appreciate that. So this is that gotcha stick. Thank you again. Um, this is that gotcha stick that we had up on the screen. But this determines the setback distance on your guards, right? So you may see how flat that is in that direction, right? And then we got this direction. So if you don't want to look like a person who doesn't understand things, let's put it politely. Um, don't go this way. Hey, I just slid that all the way through your guard. It's not compliant. No, it doesn't work that way, right? There's only one dimension represented on this tool, and that's this dimension here, right? So you would slide this through the opening in the guard, and where it stopped, if it stops on the guard, you're in good shape. If it stops because it hit the hazard, well, that means that your guard opening is too large, and you need to tighten that up, right? So that's how that works. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have a couple of these in my bag, so if anybody wants one, uh, don't grab Matt's, uh, unless, unless Matt's willing to uh, part with it, but I do have a couple, so if you want one, I'll get you one. Uh, back on safety circuits. Achieve a safe state in the event of a failure, but that, that's what my safety system is supposed to do. If the safety system fails, how do I make sure? Well, the way that we do that, there's a design methodology for that. Um, I have another definition here. This is a little bit older, so this is out of B1119, so that's an ANSI standard here. Um, this is a little bit older definition. A single component failure within the device system shall not prevent normal stopping. You see why they rewrote it, shall not prevent normal, okay, uh, but shall prevent a successive machine cycle. So even if it fails, we have to make sure that we don't allow the machine to run again. And the way we do that is through redundancy and monitoring. That's the, that's the cheat code, right? So the cheat code is redundancy and monitoring. If I have one relay that does something, I add a second relay that does the exact same thing, and then I monitor those two relays. Now, one of them is doing the work, right? And they were, they're both doing the work. And then one of, one of them's monitoring. And if it sees a mismatch in what it's supposed to see, then that monitor tells me, hey, you got a problem. You got a failure in your safety system. I'm the monitoring relay. I detected that failure. And because I detected it, I'm not going to allow this machine to run until you fix that failure. So there's an easy way to do that. A safety monitoring relay, essentially, if you've got relay logic, essentially will accomplish that. Now, it can get as complicated as you want, and that will let your controls engineers dive into all the different ways that they want to accomplish that. But with mechanical relays, there's a simple way to accomplish that. That's through redundancy and monitoring. Through modern safety controllers have this built in. This, this methodology is designed into all modern safety controllers. It's not unique to the Omron brand. I wish it was. We'd sell a whole lot more controllers. But if you've got a safety controller from a competitor, that is accomplishing the same thing. This is how we're achieving it. Okay? So the idea is that we don't want to tie our input devices, what we call ILO, you heard, heard that before? ILO, you, you seen that? Input, logic, output, right? So input, 
logic and output, right? So input would be our safety device. We've got a door lock on the machine, or we've got an area scanner, or we've got a light curtain, and we breach the light curtain, whatever it may be. That sends an input to the, to the logic or to the control, and then that's going to send an output to some device, or a, another relay, a drive, a valve, whatever that may be on the other end, right? So if we just tie in here, though, we talked about it, and you confirm because you're an ele electrician, or you're an electrical engineer or electrician. You know, controls in general. Okay. Um, but we confirmed that if I have a single relay here, I could have a complete failure that would lead to an unsafe condition. So I don't want to do that. So we'll get rid of that. And then what we do want to do is have some sort of logic control in place. And that can be as simple as a relay. It doesn't have to be a complex control. It could be a simple Safety monitoring relay that we tie in and we allow that machine to run as long as we have a safe state. Uh, and it could be as complex as a safety controller. And however, your system, really, your system design will drive what you put in the middle here, right, in the logic piece. That will all be driven by your system design and what, what's important to you. Um, so, emergency stops. Emergency stops have some, some specific rules to them. And people generally get pretty excited about emergency stops because it's just something you can feel and touch and see and everybody knows what they are. Um, so emergency stops have to be continuously operable, uh, operable um, clearly identified, and you have to be able to operate one of these devices in an emergency, in an urgent situation, right? So if I'm looking at this emergency stop here, and it's an urgent situation, and I really need to hit that emergency stop, and I come up with an open palm, and I slap that emergency stop, is the machine gonna stop? Right here. This one with the ring guard around it. No, not with an open palm. Now, if my hands are on fire, or at least it feels like they're on fire, and I try to use my shoulder, or my knee, or my forehead, is it gonna stop? Nope, no. Not if it's guarded, right? So we can't guard it. Now, is that readily accessible? That's kind of a judgment call, right? So what does readily accessible mean? Readily accessible. What do you think? Well, that's what the standard says. Standard says readily accessible. So I assume that if it's in the standard, we all understand what readily accessible is, and we all agree on the same definition, correct? No. Okay. All right. So um, here's, I, I personally, here's kind of how I look at it. If I know my operator is always here, or you look at me, I, I've been spent most of my time standing right here. Pretty good. I, I drifted a little bit. Hopefully I didn't drift off camera, but I drifted a little bit. But if I'm always right here, an e-stop right here would be great. A step and a reach, I think that's great. Now, if I got to go all the way over here to hit my e-stop, that might be too much of a distance for me to, to span, especially if there's a cart in the way or some other obstacle. But if I spend a fair amount of time over here, just like I do over there, well, then maybe I have an e-stop in both locations so that it is readily accessible from where I'm normally working. That makes sense? It's a judgment call. It's a judgment call. So it has to be readily accessible. Okay, capability of being reached quickly without having to remove obstacles or obstructions. It's the best definition we're gonna get, right? But you're gonna have to feel that out when you look at your equipment. Is that e-stop readily accessible? That'll be the question you'll ask, okay? I would, I would challenge that one. Um, okay, so this one, anybody read that? Can you read what it says? Yes, yes, it, it's, it's now something else. No, just kidding. Um, no, it's a former, so that's the machine type is a former, right? Um, but look at that e-stop. If I had an open palm, and it was really that size, it would work, but it's not. But if I came up with that open palm, shoulder, knee, forehead, I'm not gonna get a stop. Same thing here, if that's down below, and I just put my hand across the top, it's not gonna, it's not gonna actuate. Here, I like got like a, a, a like a paint can lid, like a yellow paint can, right? And you take the lid off and just cut it out. Like, all right, well, I'll put that around there. Okay, we'll just put that around our e-stop. 
So those will be examples of guarding your e-stop where you really should not be guarding your e-stop. Now, why on earth would anybody guard an e-stop? Uh, say again? Yes, exactly. I don't want people accidentally hitting the emergency stop. So I'm going to put a guard around it, and that way we don't have any accidental actuations of the emergency stop device. I guess my question would be, if it's accidentally getting tripped, why is it there? Why does it have to be in that exact location where it's accidentally getting tripped? Rather than put a guard around it, why don't we relocate the e-stop? Put it in a more readily accessible location. Move it somewhere where it stands out, where it's readily accessible, where you know you can get to it, okay? But guarding it is really not the option, okay? Okay, so um, a couple more things. I, I, I don't know why we dive so deep on uh, e-stops, but we do. It has to have a red mushroom head, okay? Yellow background, has to be self-latching, which means that you got to twist or pull to reset, all right? Direct opening contacts. Um, so I think, yeah, that symbol there will show you it's direct opening. And that means when I push on the button, I'm physically breaking the contacts apart. So that way, even if they welded, and contacts can weld, correct? Controls engineer, contacts can weld. So even if contacts weld, I can forcibly disconnect or break apart those contacts. So the e-stop may never reset, it may never work again, but even if they've welded the contacts um, with forced disconnect of the, of the contacts, um, I'll be able to break it open. Okay, enough on that. Sorry we went so deep on e-stops. Who's head spinning now? Who needs a beer after that? Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. All right, so isolation of hazardous energy. Right, so this is our lockout tag out, okay? So, hazardous energy, electromechanical. The big thing here, we're pointing out, okay? Can anybody, that, that's really tough to read. Is it? Okay, you can read that, yeah. So, men working on equipment, do not switch on. <laughs> hey, they're in good shape, right? I mean. We gave them a heads up. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Hey, you shouldn't do that. Um, yeah, hopefully it stays there. Hopefully it stays in place and we in good shape, right? So, just, we always, we always think about lockout here, but the important thing is let's not forget here and here. Okay. okay. Couple of myths, functional safety myths. Okay. So the myth is, who likes the Blues Brothers? Who knew that? I should have asked the question. Who knew? Okay. But, yep, that's Blues Brothers. All right. So, administrative controls and comprehensive employee safety training can replace good engineering. Right? Yeah? I don't know. Well, I'm not crazy about that, but we keep training our operators until they stop losing fingers. Kind of hurts <laughs> until they run out of fingers. Oh, yikes! Um, yeah, so uh, you get the idea. That, that's that's uh, not good. And uh, no, administrative controls is is not. So, but the thing is, is that we always talk about training, and I used to do a ton of training on behalf of Omron. Um, but it, it occurred to me, look, you know, who who in this room? Finished ninth grade of high school. Raise your hand if you finished ninth grade. Everybody? Okay. Mike, 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 you, you didn't raise your hand. Did you finish? Well, yep. You, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go lower if we have to. Who finished seventh? No, okay. All right. So we all finished ninth grade. Who remembers everything they learned in ninth grade? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so, does that mean that the training we received in ninth grade was not good training? Well, maybe, right? Depends on the teacher in the class you had and whatever. Okay, so maybe. Um, was it a disruptive environment? Was there kids, you know, 
doing kid stuff in the classroom, obnoxious, you know, 14 year old behavior. Sure, yeah, I mean, there's all of that, right? That doesn't mean it was necessarily bad training, but the point is that, hey, it's been quite a while since any of us have been in ninth grade. So I guarantee you, none of us remembers everything we learned in ninth grade. Training's good, don't get me wrong, but that's not the most effective way to make sure that we don't have injuries in our facilities. That's one method of maintaining, right? But we start at the top. This is called the hierarchy of design or hierarchy of measures, our friends from the Great White North call it. Um, but it starts out with design out the hazard, right? If you're building a new machine, you're designing a new machine, let's design out the hazards. Well, this is where the operators load, and if they load at the wrong time, they're gonna lose their arms. Okay, well, uh, hey, do we design that out? Do we have a robot feed? Do we have some sort of a part shoot? However that works, right? Well, let's design out that hazard. And then engineering controls, this is our safety devices. These are the bolt-ons, these are the add-ons, okay? And then we get down to administrative controls. Awareness means, training procedures, personal protective equipment. Anybody ever see anybody, you know, with the, the earplugs that are just defying gravity? It's like, well, I'm not sure those are even in there, you know. I, that doesn't hurt me, but it, it, it's certainly affecting the, the, the user, and they're not using them correctly. How about safety glasses? Anybody seen safety glasses up on top of the head instead of on the eyes? Whoops, I forgot, boss. I'm sorry. Yep, 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 we'll fix that, right? So how effective are these administrative controls? Yeah, kind of, sort of, sometimes. They work when they work, but they're easy to defeat. Well, anything down here, below this line here, anything down here, what are we relying on? Human behavior is exactly what we're relying on. Human behavior. We're relying on humans to make good decisions. I'll pay you later. Sean, I'll pay you later. Thank you. All right, that's my plant in the audience here. Um, now, administrative controls are relying on human behavior. We, we're asking humans to make good decisions based on the training and the tools that we've given them. Okay? Uh, up here, we're, we're designing it out first, and then we're relying on engineered controls. And that's the best method. Okay? So this is uh, another one of those boring standards, ANSI standard. And it says, specialized training alone shall not be used as a means of reducing the hazardous event. Um, and then it goes on if you can't guarantee it. And I don't know anybody that can. Uh, you better have one heck of a safety program if you think you're going to guard your employees by training alone, right? Okay. So um, we designed it out. We talked about this. Administrative controls, relying on humans to make good decisions. Okay, another safety myth. Using a padlock to prevent access to a movable guard is acceptable and sufficient safety measure. Can I use a padlock to lock a door closed? Because I only get in there you know, once a day, and I'll just use a padlock to open up the door and get in there on the machine. Can I do that? I've seen it. I have seen it. Some of you may have, too. We're only in there twice a shift, and I'll keep the key in my pocket. We'll be good. We'll just lock it when we're done. Okay? Nope, can't do that. Right? So, ANSI here. We're not going to read all these. ANSI, CSA. What is CSA? From what country am I pulling that? Hint, it's a little bit north of here. Canada, thank you, all right. So ANSI, Canada, international standards all say, look, if you have a movable guard, you have to interlock that guard to prevent people from getting injured, okay? It's right there. Myth number three, older machines are grandfathered in. Our machines grandfathered in. This machine is so old, right? <laughs> What's that? Only older, <laughs> Only older yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, now, can, can you all see the photo well enough to know what that is? Anybody know what that machine is? Say it, say it again. Close, yeah, yep. Like a shear? Yeah. Okay, press, yep, yep. So it's in the press family. And this is what's called a drop hammer, okay? Drop hammer. So they have, this is a, essentially a gravity drop. And then they have a steam hammer. 
Okay, so these are forging operations. These are presses, and essentially they're forging. So this is in the aerospace industry. I took this photo. This is down in Chula Vista, California, at an aerospace facility. And what they do is they're making the cowling that goes around engines, right? Aircraft engines. And so this, this essentially, you put a flat piece of sheet metal in there, and you pull the rope, and the rope, there's a, there's a, 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 a shiv up there, and that gets, the rope gets tight, so it's wrapped about three times around that shiv, and that shiv's just turning away, and as you pull it tight, it creates tension, and it lifts this up, okay? And then you just loosen up the rope, and it, bam, comes slamming down. And, and you get, operators get really good at it, and then they can just kind of, they can feather it, they can bounce it, and then get that part just the way it needs to be. And that's how they made airplanes. I kid you not. And this machine is still in existence. Well, when I took the photo a few years ago, it was still in existence. And they have to do that to support equipment because it's mil spec. You guys are familiar with mil spec. Hey, once it's specced in on an aircraft, as long as that aircraft is in existence in the US military, you have to maintain this equipment. So that is still in use. It's an old machine. This was, this was made popular in, I think they started making these in the early, early 1900s, but in the 1940s, these things were going gangbusters. Gangbusters knocking out airplane parts, okay? But those are very dangerous machines, and all you got is that rope and that hammer slamming down. Anybody get hurt on those? You could, you could, that's for sure. Say it, say it again? <laughs> You're gonna pass out real quick. Yeah, a lot of injuries on those. Um, yeah, so can it be guarded? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't easy. We really had to put our thinking caps on for this one, but it can be done. So part of what we had to do, you can barely see it. I'm gonna back up for just a second, okay? See over here, okay? This here locks that, that, that ram up. When you lift it up, you can lock it out. This'll come down and it'll lock in on both sides and it'll lock that ram in place. And that's how you do your tool changes, by the way, okay? So that'll lock out. Um, so essentially that's your only mechanism there. And so then it just slams down. So what we had to do is we had to put valves in here to operate those, okay? So that we wouldn't allow until the, uh, until the gate, so this is the front side and the back side. Uh, the gate up here had to be closed in order to lift off, to, to disengage the, 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 the hooks that hold that ram in place. So the only way you can get that hammer to actually drop down is by getting those hooks out of the way. And the only way to get the hooks out of the way is to make sure the condition is met that our guard is up. We really had to put thinking caps on them for that one. But that, that's essentially what we ended up doing. So it can be guarded. Sometimes it's tough. Yeah, this thing was built back in the 1920s. There's no way to guard that. Yep, that's what we thought. That's what they thought. And then we just sat and noodled on it. So. Um, we're good at this stuff. We can do it. We can help you, right? We got ideas. We got experience. We'll help you. What questions can I answer for you? <laughs>